Belarus across the globe in nine languages, 24-7 online, FM and satellites. Radio Belarus International, bringing Belarus closer. Minsk Dialogue Forum has gained a reputation of the venue for fruitful discussions and exchange of different opinions on international issues where opponents could really hear each other. This year's forum once again brought together prominent politicians and policy makers, but this time for online discussions. We asked Yegeni Prekherman, the director of Minsk Dialogue and International Relations, to share the details of the event. Mr. Prekherman. Misc dialogue panels are usually widely covered by media, but this year's forum was held virtually and under Chatham House rule. Could you please uh, shed a light on the nitty-gritty of the event? Uh, well, indeed, this time we decided that it has to be under the Chatham House rule, and of course the epidemic or pandemic decided for ourselves that it should be uh, in the virtual format only, even though until the last moment we still entertained some hopes that some kind of a hybrid format would be possible where at least part of participants uh, could meet here physically on the ground and then the rest could join online. But in the end we had to move fully to the online format. And uh, then we, as I said, we decided to do it under the Chatham House rule because uh, there are quite a few sensitive topics that we wanted to discover and of course when you have the Chatham House rule in place it helps to facilitate a little bit of frank discussions even though at least one component of the forum was still open to the general public we talked about the prospects of uh, regional security in Eastern Europe and specifically uh, all issues related to strategic stability and we had quite a few really distinguished speakers there so we decided that that component should go online but then as i said the rest of the forum was under the chatham house rule and there are the two main main, main topics we dealt with where the consequences of, of the pandemic for euro atlantic and eurasian security and we specifically looked at institutions international organizations working in the realm of international security most specifically the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the United Nations, and also we looked at key state actors, key states in your Atlantic and Eurasian security, which matter most in terms of where the world and the security are headed. And as you can guess, uh, this is a result of uh, a series of other events we had throughout the year where we dealt exactly with those topics under the title of the World Health Calls, implications of the uh, coronavirus for international security. Uh, I don't think that those discussions brought anything extremely new, given that, as I said, we already discussed most of it throughout the year. But as before, I think we all agree that uh, the pandemic itself did not really um, become a game changer. It did accelerate all the processes internationally, including geopolitical processes. Uh, but then what those processes look like is more or less a political issue, and it has to do with some more fundamental developments in the international system. So, for example, when we look at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the real functional organizational crisis there, and again, it has to do with the number of contradictions and problems and issues which have been there for quite some time already and those differences are between some key players within the organization and now the pandemic just brought some technical difficulties additional ones which make physical meetings impossible or sometimes possible with all sorts of restrictions but then the political issues are there and just aggravated by the situation and more or less this is the case for all other institutions and actors in international relations. And then the second block, the second thematic field uh, we addressed within the forum had to do with the Belarus crisis. And that, of course, brought major attention from our international participants. And most of the new things which were discussed at the forum had to do with this crisis. 
Uh, by the way, we had uh, more than 300 participants registered from at least four continents as we keep reiterating because perhaps there were even more, but of course there were European, North American, Asian, and even African participants both on the expert level and uh, on the official diplomatic level. And within this thematic realm, we try to understand what kind of implications the political crisis inside Belarus would have for Belarus over relations with Western countries, namely the EU and the United States, with Russia, and then more generally with within the space of European or East European security, and even a little bit broader than Eurasian security. So all those issues were discussed and uh, we're still digesting uh, those results. And how do the experts see the perspectives of solution of the situation in Belarus as the country is trying to preserve its national stability and national unity, uh, as well as uh, confronting international pressure and trying to maintain dialogue with the, with the West? Well, I think everyone tends to agree that any crisis and the Belarus crisis we are currently experiencing in particular needs to be resolved through a dialogue. And that's something which perhaps each and every one speaker of the forum reiterated during, during his or her speeches. But of course, when it comes to such quite complicated situations, everyone has his or her own understanding of what this dialogue should look like, who it should involve, what the agenda should be about. And of course, all those differences were pretty much obvious during our discussions. I cannot say that our primary goal was to talk about the Belarus crisis itself, because we're, we are a platform which is focused on international relations and security in the region. And for us, since the early moment of our inception, uh, the key goal was to make sure that we stay geopolitically unbiased, and that we have all key geopolitical actors present, and unlike what happens at other uh, forums and on other discussion platforms, we are always concerned that the Minsk dialogue platform, geopolitical rivals, should speak to each other, not just about each other or behind each other's back. So that should remain our key goal, and that's why even talking about the Belarus crisis, we mainly focus on its international implications. And uh, there we also find quite a lot of commonalities in how different actors different geopolitical actors look at this crisis everyone agrees that we need to do everything possible to contain all the tensions within the country rather than to give them to let them out because were they let out that could easily lead to very serious geopolitical ramifications and so that could lead to well even some kind of a ukraine type scenario in the worst case so no one is interested in that. But of course, it's not enough just to agree on this, given the differences in how countries and institutions see the reality of the ground, given the differences of their values, perceptions, approaches. It's always important to find this very practical roadmap, if you will, which should help these wishful, uh, these wishes to, to become reality rather than to stay wishful thinking. And of course, we, we, we did speak about that a lot, but I guess uh, the forum just demonstrated that, as always, after some broader discussions, we need to do quite a lot of work to focus on more specific things which were touched upon during the event, and perhaps sometimes, again, in very discreet formats rather than publicly before arriving at some solutions that will work for everyone in the practical realm, not just rhetorically. Do you assume any serious shifts in Belarusian foreign policy as uh, many experts uh, believe that their multi-vector diplomacy is collapsed? Well, that's of course now a popular subject for discussion and uh, I guess a lot of commentators who speak about that sometimes um, infuse a bit of a political agenda rather than analysis. In my view, if we are analytical about this issue, that even what has happened, and that has obviously brought about some fundamental changes in uh, present-day 
communication and relations between Minsk and uh, primarily Western capitals. But even this does not change the very basics of Belarus and Belarusian foreign policy. It's just enough to look at the map of Belarus and to understand where geographically, geopolitically, and geostrategically, if you will, it sits. And that map basically dictates the foreign policy priorities for the country as such and for any leadership this country has or is going to have in the future. And what we usually understand by the concepts of multi-vector foreign policy is simply a very natural desire and need to act out of your objective realities, primarily driven by your economic interest to have as productive and as efficient economic relations as possible with everyone. And we are not only in, in, in an in-between position uh, geopolitically, but we are also what economists call a small and open economy, which means that most of our GDP uh, crosses our borders, either as imports, and then we use those imports to produce something, or, and this is most, most of the case, as exports. So we export really a lot because our internal market is, is limited. It's only uh, less than 10 million people. And it, for that reason, to, to facilitate economic exchange, we naturally need more or less stable and comfortable political relations with most of our uh, partners. And those partners normally tend to be geopolitically important actors. Russia, of course, no doubt the number one strategic partner, but also the European Union secondly most important in terms of trade and therefore requiring uh, some normal political relations. Also the United States, a little bit far away, but still given the economic cloud of the United States and the international financial system and international economics, again, we cannot just ignore those relations. And the same with China. So this is all to say that even though we are now living through this extraordinary period, which is not, of course, the first time we have lived for such extraordinary periods, but still, you know, it does disrupt quite a lot in, in terms of all the work which has been done in recent years. But then, as I said, and I just reiterated once again, it does not really change anything fundamentally, and that's why it would be at least premature to talk about the end of Belarus multi-vector foreign policy. The experts admit that 2020 is a disruptive year for all spheres. How has the situation in terms of international relations aggravated since uh, the last forum focused on stepping back from the brink? Well, it's, the change has been dramatic, and uh, even the title of last year's forum suggested that the situation in Eastern Europe was quite bad and quite dramatic. As you rightly reminded us, it was uh, about we were thinking how to uh, step aside, step away from the break. But in the last year since that forum, the situation has gone worse. And actually, the short report that we prepared for this online forum, which was presented in the forum, and which is also accessible uh, at our website, the Style of Council on International Relations website. So we, it, it talks about those negative developments and gives some figures. Uh, basically, there was a widely held expectation at the beginning of the pandemic that because of its effects, uh, at least in the realm of, in the military realm, there could be some, perhaps some positive effects uh, that military activities, including exercises and armament programs, would need to stop and somehow they would uh, make countries a little bit calmer. But in fact, what happened in reality is quite the opposite. Yes, some military exercises were either paused or uh, their scale uh, turned out to be smaller than initially planned. But still, quite a lot of military activity did happen. The armament programs have been activated in many respects, even though, as we write in the report, no major new types of arms were brought into the region, into East European region. But uh, the intensity of rearmament was quite high, the budgets have been growing, and that's, of course, a longer-term trend we've been observing over the last several years. But most importantly, and perhaps 
potentially most uh, worrying and alarming is the fact that because of the pandemic, the pandemic has also had a very negative impact on uh, all sorts of arms control uh, things, including, you know, the very fact that the last bastions, the last uh, arms agreements in the in the field of arms control are now almost gone. Uh, the latest one being the Open Skies Treaty. So the United States and the Trump administration announced officially that they were going to leave the treaty. So the world is left almost without any arms control uh, mechanisms, which of course adds to the losses in this uh, field that we had in previous years. And the discussions which uh, the military usually refer to as the CSBM, Confidence and Security Building Measures, they've all been derailed these, this year as well, and they, including because of the pandemic. So people even there started to talk loud to each other. And all this is, as I said, is very, very worrying. We don't know where the next year will take us. We more or less understand that the economic troubles will continue. Again, there are some expectations that against the background of economic difficulties countries might uh, devote less finances to their military, but this is, again, not a given, and sometimes the overall result might be negative. So I hope that next year's forum and the report will be pre prepared for the forum will contain some positive side, positive pages, but to be honest with you, you know, realistically, the expectations are uh, quite modest on my side. So thank you very much. We also hope for more optimistic news and also hope that the next year forum will be returned to its uh, traditional form. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Belarus can cross the globe in nine languages, 24-7, online, FM and satellites. Radio Belarus International, bringing Belarus closer. closer.